So, uh, good morning. Um, today we are going to speak about computer graphics and in particular about rendering. Uh, this lecture is based on a course given by uh, Kenan Cranes on computer graphics uh, and a book uh, uh, which deals with computer graphics. And I would like to take the opportunity and to thank for, uh, to Lior, Yoriv, and Yoni Kasten, Oren Basri, and Yon Lipan for some fruitful discussion that I had with them in order to prepare this uh, lecture. So, so, so far we dealt in this course with computer vision text, um, processing over 2D images, you heard about classification, detection, of an object in an image, image generation, segmentation. Actually, um, there is another interesting topic in computer vision, uh, which is called geometry. We didn't uh, discuss it. Uh, in this setting, uh, when you have uh, given uh, give a collection of a uh, set of images, to the images, the aim is to solve the problem of structure for motion, which means to uh, estimate the location and the rotation, the, the position and the orientation of the cameras, like here in red, and also the 3D structure. Actually, this result is taken from our, one of recent publication by uh, Hodaya and uh, Bro. Um, okay, now um, when we are talking about computer graphics, the idea is the opposite direction. You have some geometry and you, the aim is to produce photorealistic images like this okay and this is the topic that we are going to deal uh, with it today about how generating photorealistic images so um just to that everybody will be on the same page so photorealistic image formation in computer graphics is called rendering and this is the exact definition that I took from uh, some uh, uh, paper, a uh, review paper, which say that the process of transforming a scene definition, including cameras, lights, surface geometry, and material, into a simulated camera image is called rendering. Okay? Actually, all the ingredients of the image formation are modeled in computer graphics. Light sources, scene geometry, material properties, light transport, optics, and sen sensor behavior, okay? So um, let's try to understand uh, the pipeline of photorealistic rendering. And then <clears throat> in the lecture, each part will uh, get attention and explanation. So given an application, an application could be game engine, movie production, or just even just texture mapping. We would like to take into account the scene definition. This is the scene definition. Okay, we'd like to take all these ingredients together <clears throat> to do a process which is called rendering and to generate some photorealistic image. Okay, the scene is defined by several ingredients, the camera, the viewing direction and other properties, optic properties of the camera, the geometry, the materials of the, of the, of the object in the scene, and the, the setting of the lights in the scene, okay? In general, uh, the geometry is given by polygon, like what you see here, and the process of uh, drawing polygon on the screen is called rasterization. Actually, just uh, as, as a uh, side uh, remark, um, before the era of deep learning, the graphic processing unit, the performance of the graphic processing unit, which help us to draw triangles from the object to the screen, uh, was evaluated but how, by how many triangles uh, can the, this general processing unit can draw in one second, for example. This is the way uh, the GPU uh, Actually, it was invented for drawing triangles for rasterization. And uh, uh, the way the performance was evaluated by the speed of uh, a, a 
rowing uh, triangles. Nowadays, as you already know, it, uh, it is dedicated for uh, deep uh, learning tasks. Okay. Just to give you some flavor for photorealistic image, uh, this is an image that was rendered by some uh, scene definition. As you see here, you have some, something which is a, a mirror or something which is transparent. Uh, and it seems quite good. There is also a shadow here. Um, but it's not good enough when you look at the other image, which take into account more uh, uh, gradient, for example, it takes into account here something which is called global illumination. Okay, so when you flicker between those two images, you understand that the second image is more realistic than the first one. Um, we also will speak about neural rendering. Uh, and this is the definition of neural rendering, which I'll, I'll, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I, I took from this um, review paper. And uh, the definition is, is as follows. Deep image neural rendering is defined by deep image or video generation uh, approaches that enable explicit or implicit control of scene properties, such as illumination, camera parameters, pose, geometry, appearance, and semantic structure. Actually, uh, it brings the promise of addressing both reconstruction and rendering by using deep networks to learn complex mappings from captured images to novel images. Today, we are going to speak only about classical rendering. In the next lecture, we are going to dive into uh, deep rendering, deep computer graphics. Okay, so the idea today is that everybody will be on the same page and you will understand or will be familiar with very uh, 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 fundamentals of uh, computer graphics. And then the next lecture, we'll speak about uh, deep approaches. So just to give you some flavor about uh, what is the, uh, just a minute, why doesn't it run, sorry. There it is, okay. Um, trying to operate this. Let me, that's it. Just cool uh, video from Seagraph uh, 2020. Um, and this cool video show you some very interesting uh, uh, Welcome to the SIGGRAPH 2020 application of computer story. graphics. We'll present clips from just a few of the exciting breakthroughs in the technical papers program. A learning-based approach to keyframe video stylization enables this artist to craft a personal look in real time. By using four fisheye monochrome cameras, we can track someone's hands in space, enabling them to sort these blocks and win the game. Using clever hinge design, a flat lattice of thin, flexible strips can be deformed into a complex 3D structure and then flattened back out again. To create a realistic knit bunny, this algorithm uses an energy density function to drive a thin shell simulator. It can also knit armadillos. By interpolating a sparse series of 3D poses, this algorithm produces smooth, complex motion that still allows for artistic control. This algorithm supports immersed bubbles in free surface flow simulators, producing the familiar glugging action of a water cooler. A method for managing the dynamics of nonlinear deformable objects lets us bounce this hairy, elastic toy against a wall. Welcome. So let's move on. Just you can I off, I'm at offline see all the movie, very nice movie. So computer graphics is everywhere, entertainment, games, movies, um, in uh, industrial de <coughs> industrial design. Just a minute. Uh, in computer aided engineering, in architecture, and so on and so on. So uh, let's uh, now. Uh, take each ingredient of this pip pipeline and talk about it and understand what everything means and how do we render a photorealistic image. So let's start with, start with the camera. I guess that almost all of you are, uh, uh, took the uh, intro computer vision course, so 
I'm going to be familiar with the with the this slide with the next slide. So uh, in many uh, realistic cases, we would like to take we would like to take into account the perspective projection that uh, 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 comes with, with the images that captured by cameras. Uh, there are actually uh, two main things. Objects look smaller as they go, get further away. In parallel lines, we need infinity. It looks like this. And to illustrate it, as you already know, we use the pinhole camera model. For example, here I have a 3D object. And this is, this is just a 1D slice. And for example, the image is located here, where this is the z-axis. Okay, The camera pinhole is at uh, the origin. And uh, using uh, similar triangles, we know that, for example, the 3D coordinate Y becomes Y over Z when we look at the image, OK? It's, it's uh, proportional to, uh, to, to 1 over Z, OK? I, I guess that all of you are familiar with it, so I don't have to waste uh, time on it. OK, so let's move on. Let's now speak about the rasterization process, the rendering process, OK? So the idea is the following. When we say drawing, we mean drawing on the screen for the movie, for the game, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so imagine that this is a screen, this uh, image playing in the screen. I have some scenario, I have some a scene object here. And the idea is uh, that I would like to, uh, to get on the image what I see on the screen by moving from 3D to 2D including the shadow and including the, the ball, including the effect of the lights, OK? So how are we going to do this rendering? Just a minute. OK, so I would like to take into account the viewpoint, the light sources, the geometry, and the material properties. So let's start with a very naive uh, uh, direction. Just we would like to draw on the screen uh, some geometry. And since in computer graphics, almost everything is triangle, we can think about objects that are made of a triangle mesh. Uh, actually, there are two ways of turning a triangle into an image. One is called rasterization, and the other called is ray tracing. By the way, I just want to understand how many are familiar with these terms. Is anybody familiar with rasterization or ray tracing? OK, so this is, for, this is a, for an example of rasterization. You have a, 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 a triangle that you want to project it to the screen. And you ask our, ourselves which set of pixels are covered by this triangle. OK, this is rasterization. And I would like to, uh, make, uh, to, to, uh, to explain the difference between rasterization and ray tracing. And here I'm doing it. So rasterization means the following. For each triangle in the scene, in the 3D scene, I'm asking which pixels are covered by this triangle, like here, OK? In ray tracing, the order is the opposite order. For each pixel, I'm sending a ray, and I'm asking which primitive I are seen by this, by this ray. For example, here, we don't have triangle. We have qu quite, never mind, OK. We don't have triangle. We have other polygon. And for example, from this ray, we don't hit any uh, polygon from the scene, OK? So the order is the opposite. Since uh, here we go on the triangle and projecting, project them on the screen, we can do it in parallel. Therefore, this is extremely fast, the rasterization process, such that I take each triangle and project it on the screen. I can do it parallel. It becomes very fast billion of triangles per second on GPU. This uh, process, it's quite slow. That I take each ray, and I'm asking for, the, for each ray, which of the uh, uh, polygon intersect the ray. I have to go over the, the entire set of the polygons, and this takes a lot of time. Um, but uh, it's in rasterization, it's harder to get photorealism, while by ray tracing, it's easier to get photorealism. So if I want to do some real-time application and the performance is not uh, very uh, um, 
important. For example, for game, I'll use rasterization. But if I want to invest time and to invest uh, GPU, I for movies and video clips, for example, and I would like to get something which is very photorealistic, I'm going to use ray tracing. Okay. <clears throat> Just to let you understand the, the difference between rasterization and ray tracing, here the image is rendering from the same from the same scene. I have three objects, and this is made by rasterization, the rendering, and this is made by ray tracing. You immediately see that here the reflection of an object on another object are pretty thin, and also the shadows are very natural and photorealistic, but in the rasterization seem less photorealistic, as, as we said before. The ray tracing take into account many global effects, while the rasterization take uh, some local effects and, and less global effects. Okay. <clears throat> Another issue that uh, we have to deal with it is the visibility problem. So in the rasterization, I have, for example, two triangles and I have pixel. And I would like to ask, uh, we would like to ask ourselves, first of all, what pixels does the triangle uh, overlap? Okay, what, what uh, a triangle covers, which triangle cover him? But in order to answer to the visibility, visibility problem, we would like to answer which triangle is closest to the camera in each pixel, the red or the blue. I'll take the one which is closer. This is what I see, okay? This is from the rasterization viewpoint, from the triangle viewpoint. Same thing happened with ray tracing, and I would like to illustrate it with two roads. One road is blue, one road is uh, red. And uh, this is just uh, for illustration, this is uh, uh, a virtual sensor, which is 1D, not 2D like a mutual like an image. So I know that this ray, okay, this one uh, meets the, uh, the blue road. However, however, I, al I also know that this, uh, this uh, uh, two pixels, for example, although uh, uh, the blue ray will, will see them, it first hits the, the red road, therefore, the image will be red, blue, and then red, okay? So we have to answer also in the visibility problem when we shoot rays from the uh, pinhole camera through the image, okay? Uh, next issue is geometry. Um, and why do we use triangles? First of all, let's try to answer this question. Actually, any geometry can be uh, translated to a triangle mesh, like here, for example. This is a zoom of this, uh, uh, this uh, corner. Okay. And uh, the reason that it can approximate any shape, and one very important benefit is that any uh, triangle is, uh, is planar, Therefore, it, is, it has a well-defined normal, and this is very useful. Also, it's easy to interpolate data from the corners of the triangle to the, entire, uh, to the in, uh, internal points in the triangle using something which is called barycentric coordinates, and we'll speak about it soon. This is very uh, useful also. Moreover, each element is going to be described by triangles, even point and lines. And then you can generate an optimized and uniform drawing pipeline since everything is triangular and you don't have to do some exception. Okay, is it clear? Okay. So geometry can be very, uh, can, can be vary a lot from just uh, uh, cups of wines to, to something which is industrial, to faces, etc., etc. And uh, I would like to, uh, uh, to speak about two kinds of uh, scene representation. The first one is the explicit uh, scene representation, which is actually, I guess you are familiar with it, the discretization of the object geometry. So there are some kind of uh, explicit representation. One of them is by voxels. The problem is by, by voxels that it consume 
a lot of memory when you would like to get high resolution of uh, discretization of the object. Also, <clears throat> there are point clouds like, like this, when you get X, Y, Z, which determine the surface of the object. And also there are triangle meshes uh, like uh, this bunny. Uh, and triangle meshes benefit uh, uh, the idea that we have also the connectivity over the object, while in the point clouds we don't have it. We have to do some operation or some processing to understand which point is neighbor of the other point. Okay. Now we can also, as you already know, I guess, you can also uh, uh, um, describe this the scene by a continuous representation, which is called implicit. If it's simple scene like this, we can you, you can use algebraic uh, surfaces like just the the, the 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 sphere here or the torus here just by some algebraic expression. But also, as you already may be seen in uh, deep uh, architecture, that you can use the level set of a function when and you can describe the surface by the zero level set of a function from x y z to r. Okay. In a more general case, you can also say that you can describe the, the, uh, the surface by some sign distance function like this. So for example, here it's in 2D, but it's okay. It's in 2D, this is the surface, okay? And I'm, I'm looking for a function that outside will be positive, out of the surface, inside will be negative, and on the surface is going to be zero. And actually, one, one of the way uh, to, uh, uh, to do it is to do it by, uh, by solving the iconal equation. This is called sine distance transform. Inside, I have uh, <coughs> a, a negative, val a negative value, and outside, I have positive value. And here, I have uh, zero. <coughs> and uh, if we solve some partial differential equation, which is non-linear, which is the following. Um, the, the magnitude of the gradient at each point, okay, inside the, the shape should be one, and outside the, and, and on the boundary, on the surface should, should be zero. This will let us have the sine distance function in the following sense. For each point, outside and inside, the, the f function, this f function will give us the distance from the point to the boundary, the shorter distance from the point to the boundary, okay? So if we solve it, we have some uh, a kind of sine distance function. There are ways to solve this, these non-linear differential equations, there are ways to solve it. And then later on, we'll see in the next lecture uh, that you can solve it or you, you don't have to solve it, but there are some ways to represent this uh, sine distance function. Okay. Any question? Okay. So just to pros and cons of uh, implicit and ex explicit representation. Uh, in the implicit representation, description can be very compact, just for the right surfaces. And it's very easy to determine if the point is inside or outside the shape, that shape to, to, to plug in and to do the test. However, it's expensive, or not, even not easy to generate all the shape, all the point of the shape. On the other end, when we speak about explicit representation, when we have easy representation, we just have a list of e -Z, Z, so we can immediately generate the shape. However, it's hard to test whether a point is inside or outside the shape. We have to do some, uh, some process. And, <clears throat> and it's easy to generate uh, uh, the geometry, okay? Okay, let's continue. Um, I'm going to speak about uh, triangle mesh and the way that uh, we, we use to represent geometries. So let's start with very naive example. Um, let's say that I have a, a tetrahedron with four vertices, 0, 1, 2, and 3, and with uh, four faces, four triangles, four polygons. The way that uh, I uh, uh, represent this triangle mesh 
is by storing uh, its uh, coordinates, like here. For each vertex, I store the coordinates. And for each triangle, I store the uh, indices that, that this triangle traverses. For example, 0, 1, 2, okay, like here. Okay? This is the way I, uh, I uh, uh, represent triangle mesh. This is the way I represent explicit geometry. A uh, very uh, useful uh, um, notion in uh, triangle mesh uh, is the <coughs> use of the barycentric coordinates. Uh, what, is, what are the barycentric coordinates? So here is the issue. Uh, let's say that I have some canonical uh, uh, triangle with this coordinate 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. Actually, uh, any uh, uh, triangle can be transformed from this canonical uh, uh, representation to any other triangle, but some, but some other transformation. Okay. And now uh, I have a new, uh, new triangle, which can be in R3, not, not, in, not necessarily in R2, with new nodes, vertices, which I call PI, PJ, and PK. They have new coordinates in R3, for example. Now I'm asking myself the following. I have a new a point which resides on the triangle, and I would like to use a, a linear combination of the vertices, PI, PJ, and PK, to determine this point, to represent this point. This weighted uh, linear combination is called the barycentric coordinate. This PI, PJ, PK are called barycentric coordinate. And actually, uh, they are non-negative, and they are sum to one, OK? Uh, like uh, what you, if you're familiar with the convex combination, this is the same idea, OK? Where does it come from, this very certain coordinate, and why is it useful? So let's try to understand. Actually, it comes from a very, very simple thing that you're familiar with. Let's say that uh, I would like, I, I have some, uh, 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 I'm now in R2, I, I have some triangle resides on the plane with coordinate pi, pk, and pj. And for each uh, point, I have some function on it, fpi, fpk, and, F, and fpj. Okay. Now, I would like to do, to do two-dimensional linear interpolation. What do I mean by that? I would like to draw or to, to have a surface which is represented by this uh, linear uh, or affine uh, uh, surface, ax plus by plus c such that the surface will coincide with uh, the values of the, function, of the function at the vertices, OK? Everybody is familiar with it. So I'll get some function, f hat. It turns out that this function can be, can be uh, expressed by the barycentric coordinate, which I, what do I mean by that? But if I'll have a point p here, OK, or here in the, uh, on, the, on the triangle, then the value of the point by this 2D linear interpolation can be expressed by phi i times the value at pi, i, phi j is times the value at pj, plus phi k times the value at, at pk. Okay? And what, what, what values that uh, this phi i, phi, phi i, and phi j, and phi k attain? They attain the following values. Okay? Um, if this is the triangle, and I would like to know which value I'm going to give to pj when I'm going to describe this point p, it turns out that this is the ratio between the area of this triangle divided by the entire area of the triangle. Why this is intuitive? Because let's think about a point p which sits very near to this uh, edge. So I would like to give almost zero weight for PJ. So the area of the triangle comprised by this small triangle will be close to zero. And therefore, most of the contribution will come from the other vertices and not from this vertex. OK? So this is barycentric coordinate. And why is, is it useful? Let's see an example. 
So various technical coordinates are used to interpolate any attributes which, which, which are associated with the vertices of the triangle. For example, color. So if I had here red and green and blue, and I'm using the barycentric coordinate, phi i, phi, phi j, and phi k to describe the color in the internal, in, internal points of the triangle, I get this uh, uh, color inside the triangle. Okay, is this clear? Okay, nobody answers, so I hope mm -hmm. yes. Is this clear? Can, can you please re explain again uh, regarding the ratios of the, of the areas? Yes, sure. Um, I, I, there are some ways to. Uh, um, to illustrate what is two-dimensional two, two linear interpolation. So one way is to say, OK, I'm taking this uh, Afan uh, formulation, and I'm looking for A and B and C, such that this will approximate the function by some linear approximation, the origi original function that I had before. Here, what, I, what you see, the curved one. So you can take it and you can solve a, 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 a system of linear equation and you look for A, B, and C, and you understand what to plug in for A and to B and to C in order to get this linear interpolation. However, it can be shown, I didn't show it, that <clears throat> it's equivalent, it's totally equivalent, that if you want to know the estimation of the A, two-dimensional linear interpolation at each point in the uh, P, which reside inside the triangle, you can take a combination of the values of the function at the vertices, FPK, FPJ, and, F and FPI, and weights them by this Phi, Phij, and Phi K. Okay? And these weights, okay, Phi, Phij, and Phi K are exactly the ratios between, uh, for example, phi j, okay, it's going to be the ratio between the area of this triangle divided by the entire area of the triangle which I'm looking at, okay? Is it clear now? I understand how you do, how you, how you calculate these uh, parameters, but are they equivalent, the two methods? Equivalent, or totally that... equivalent, yeah. So why why should I use this and not the other one? The other one seems more like more simple, no? What's the other one? This one? The one, yes, the linear combination, like A, X, and A, A B, and C. Okay, but this uh, representation give you in, in just very easy calculation how to take what you have in the vertices. From here, you don't see what you have in the vertices, right? You have to do some manipulation to see what you have in the vertices. But if I have something at the vertices, like here, and I want immediately to understand how I, I diffuse the information for the vertices inside the triangle, this is immediate. I can take the, the, any attribute from the vertices, calculate the ratios of triangles, and diffuse the information from the outside to the inside. OK, so the, the original computation was for triangles for the uh, heads of the triangles, and then if I want to do another calculation, so it's easier. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Mirab, in this example, uh, yes, with the colors, well, sometimes we have let's say black colors. That everything is equal to twenty five, two hundred fifty five, or if you normalize to one. So you said that the sum of the phi is, is needs to be equal to one. So how does it uh, fit to that? I'm not sure I got your question. Let's say I have a color, uh, one, one, one is a white color, right? Hmm? So okay. in this case, how phi is going to be one, one, and one, and it's sum to three, not to one. I'm, I'm not sure I get your questions. You have some color, for example, RGB color. Yes, I have a RGB color. Uh, let's say a color white. Yeah. 
and the sum of color white in this case would be three, not a uh, one. So start with the one over three, one over three, one over three, okay? Just uh, to don't, uh, okay? I'm, I'm not sure it's, it's not crucial. Let, let's uh, let, let, let's uh, continue with this. So for example, if, if I'm uh, um, starting with R, it's one, zero, zero. If I'm starting with blue, it's zero, one, zero, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's, we can, we can continue, I understand can continue with it okay okay just to let you have how it goes with the rasterization pipeline so if i have a sample of triangles like here and i would like to cover it by 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 color then uh, i can interpolate the attributes from the uh, vertices to get uh, the color on the triangle and also i can sample in the same way texture map and to evaluate the texture on the triangle Okay, this is this is the idea and the use of the of the of the very setting uh, coordinate. Moving on to geometry uh, in the respect of surfaces. Um, so we discussed triangle mesh, and I want to uh, to explain what kind of surfaces we are going to deal with. So I'm going to make it very intuitive and not formal because the formal way is just uh, very complicated. And just I think we can do it very very intuitive. So what is the surface? The surface is the boundary or shell of an object. Uh, actually, sur surfaces are manifold in the sense that if you zoom in, like here, you can draw a regular coordinate grid, like what we see here. Just this is the idea. You can do it at any, on any point on the surface. For example, here, this is not a surface. This is not a manifold, since here, no matter how much I'm going to zoom in, I cannot draw a regular grid like this okay this is very intuitive there are a lot of theory about this not going to go into details okay so examples for manifolds or surfaces of course this is not a manifold we just discussed it this is yes 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 and here it is not a manifold do you know why any idea anybody has an idea You see the intersection here, right? So when when a, a, a shape intersects itself like this, it's not a manifold, it's not a surface, because locally you cannot draw some 2D grid, okay? Like we draw before. So the idea is that when you make you, you come closer to the surface, for from cross plot point of view, it's going to be some two-dimensional uh, 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 area, and here it doesn't happen. Okay, so this is not not a manifold. Okay, um, it turns out that when you speak about a polygonal mesh or triangular mesh, what we spoke before, it's very easy to check whether you have a manifold and you don't have a manifold. So there are some rules. And the world as follows every edge is incident only to one or two polygons okay no more than that like this okay here for example it is incident to more than one to one or two polygons okay and this is not not a manifold <clears throat> okay the polygons incident to a vertex from form a a a, a fan like this or closed or, or an open one like this this is this is a fan Okay, we, here we don't have a fan, this is not a manifold. Here we have, and here we are close to the boundary, so we have an open fan, okay? Okay, so near the boundary, uh, we have to take uh, care to ask ourselves what is exactly a boundary. So the boundary is where the surface ends, like this. From local point of view, we have half disk. From global point of view, we form a loop, like this. And the polygon mesh, we have one polygon per boundary edge, okay, like here, and uh, the vertex uh, of the of the boundary uh, the boundary vector look, look like here like a Pac-Man. Okay, this is very heuristic, just to let you have some some idea. <clears throat> just uh, that you will get uh, an impression of a polygonal mesh at different resolution. This is the very fine resolution. This is the, the coarsest resolution that we have uh, we have here. Okay. 
Okay, we are moving to a, a, a very interesting topic, which is the essence of the rendering uh, process, which is called ray mesh intersection. So think about a ray which travels from the sun, for example, and we want to know where, where, where the ray, or if the ray, and if yes, where the ray presses the triangular mesh. For example, here, it presses twice, here and here. Um, this is a crucial step towards visibility and ray tracing and rendering. Okay, so let's try to understand how we solve this problem. So, uh, actually, uh, there are ways to do it fast, but we'll first up, uh, explain how to do it in a naive way, okay? So, this is just uh, some algebra. I'm going to uh, express the ray by uh, the ray source, like here, by some unidirection D, okay, which is uh, illustrated here, and by some, <coughs> by some parameter theta that I don't know him, but it, it parameterized the ray along, uh, it parameterized uh, the ray uh, which starts at, at uh, source O in direction D, okay? This is the ray equation. What I'm going to do with this, I'm trying to understand if this is the parameterization and I have the parameterization of the triangle, one triangle in a mesh, is this two uh, 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 ray and the polygon are going to be in intersected, okay? So actually what I want to do, I want to understand whether the ray intersect the triangle. Um, but let's try to do something which is, which is easier, since each tri triangle resides on a plane, okay, like this. Let's first try to understand whether the ray intersect the plane which the triangle resides on it. And if so, let's try to understand how to solve the second step, that if uh, the ray uh, uh, intersect the plane, uh, whether it intersect also the triangle. So let's first solve the, the easier uh, part of the question. Okay, let's try to understand whether the ray intersect the plane. Okay, is it clear, the idea? Yes. Okay. So how I'm expressing a, a, a surface by the normal and this is the point, n transpose x equal to c. So n is the unit normal, c is the offset. Very easy to, uh, to uh, express a plane. And this is the expression of the ray. So what I'm going to do now, any ideas? If I want to know if there is intersection, what I'm going to do? See where they are equal. Exactly, I'm going to plug in instead of x, r of t, like this, and to understand what is the value of t, the parameter which I don't know, okay? So, n transpose r t equals c, n transpose o plus t d equals c, therefore t equals to this expression divided by the uh, 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 inner product of n and d. Uh, Immediately you see that if this is zero, what does it mean? If the, if the denominator is zero, what does it mean? It doesn't intersect. Does it intersect because the ray is parallel to the plane, exactly. So when I'm taking this T and plug it back to, the, uh, to RT, I get a, a, an expression for the intersection, which has the following conditions. If it's zero here, it does not intersect. But also if T is negative, it does not intersect because it's the, in, opposite, the, in, in the opposite direction, okay? It's not in the direction of D, it's in the direction of the minus D. So if <clears throat> this expression is going to be positive, it means that the ray intersects the plane, right? And now I would like to know if intersect the plane, it intersects also the uh, the triangle. Uh, okay, it's not necessary that intersect the plane, it, it intersects also the triangle. Okay, 
So uh, in order to uh, determine whether a point intersects a triangle, I first compute the rate, rate plane intersection. Uh, and then I'm going to compute the bar ascending coordinate of the heat points, of the heat point. Now, if the, all the bar ascending coordinates are positive, it means that the point is in the triangle. Otherwise, it is not. And now, how are, going, how are we going to do that? OK, Let, let's do it uh, in a short uh, algebraic way. So um, I'm going to, I have a triangle, OK? And I have a ray parameterized by O and D. And I'm going to use uh, the uh, parameterization of the barycentric coordinate. It means that I can uh, write any uh, point uh, on the triangle by u times p1, v times p2, and the rest time p0. Okay. Now I would like to know does the point resides p reside on the triangle? So I'm taking the point that uh, I already calculated from the intersection of the plane and the ray. I'll call it P, for example. And then I'm solving the following equation for U and V. OK? Just made some uh, arrangements of the right arrangement. I just uh, uh, take P, P1 minus P0 times U, P2 minus is exactly the same. Visually, it looked like this. OK? I just uh, moved everything by P0. So I'm solving this. And if U and V and the rest are zero, uh, are, sorry, are uh, non-negative, then the point P resides on the triangle. So I have a way that given a point uh, which resides on the plane to know where it's, it, it results also in the triangle. Actually, we can do it in a shorter way. Immediately, we can use the barycentric coordinate without the first calculation that we did before. We can take the parameterization of a point by O plus TD. And we can solve the following uh, uh, equation. We can solve immediately for u, v, and t by plugging p here, like o plus t, d. t is unknown. This is going to be equal to the uh, parameterization of the barycentric coordinate. And I'm going to solve it for u, v, and t. So if u and v are non negative and t is also non negative, so it means that they, there is intersection. And I know where is the intersection and the ray intersects the plane. Okay? Okay. Any questions? Okay, let's move on. This is a very naive algorithm. Given a ray, I'm going to scan all triangles. And there are a lot of triangles and a lot of rays, and this can take a lot of time. Actually, there are some hierarchical approaches and dedicated hardware that help us to make it faster. I'm not going to go into it, but just uh, uh, to, let, to, have, to, to let you have some uh, uh, intuition um, about the uh, performance. This is done by uh, ray tracing, by ray intersection, by rendering of ray tracing. And this takes 50 hours per frame to generate this rendering of one frame of a movie, just to, to understand that it's it's very expensive so we, we do care about performance we want to do it faster but we still want to have the photorealistic uh, effects that can be gained by a uh, ray tracing and it takes time okay uh, i would suggest that we will have um six minutes break till 10 past 10 okay because we still have a lot of material to cover uh, is it okay? 10 past 10, let's make a break. Yes, thanks. Yes. So, uh, next issue is the lights uh, and radiometry. And this is uh, actually uh, an important issue. I, I try to facilitate as much as possible. I hope I, I succeeded. Let's see. So uh, um, our aim is to uh, regenerate photorealistic images. And in order to do this, we would like to answer which color is going to be at each pixel and how much light we are going to have at each pixel. 
For example, here we are asking ourselves why some part of the surface are look darker or whiter or lighter than the others. And we're going to answer to these questions. Uh, the final image is such that at every point, at each pixel, I would like to know what color and how intense or bright is the color. Okay. Um, so rendering is more than just a uh, 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 word color. We, we need to know how much light hits each pixel. This is color, this is an intensity, and the combination of them give us photorealistic image, like what you see. Here it's lighter, here it's darker, okay? So we are going to describe all this issue. Okay, just a minute. Okay, just um, a few words. Light, as you know, already know, is from one side photons, particles, and from the other side is electromagnetic radiations. It has a wavelength, it has a spectrum. This is the way you measure the light. So this is the visible spectrum between uh, 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers, okay, uh, of uh, wavelength. And just to uh, understand the, the situation, uh, what is the color? What is exactly the color? So uh, why bananas appear yellow, okay? So when the light hits, the bunch of the bananas, the full spectrum fall on, on the bananas, but only the wavelength between this number and this number in nanometers, which represent the yellow light, are going to, to bounce off and to reach our light, our, our eye, sorry. Okay? So you can measure this electromagnetic magnetic radiation by, by, uh, by a dedicated sensor, and this is the way this is done. So all, all this uh, issue is called radiometry, the idea of uh, measuring light. And we are going to understand, first of all, what are the terms radiance and irradiance. And all of the terms are with respect to energy and what kind of energy is going to be described soon. So first of all, it's a bit confusing. We have radiance, we have irradiance. So radiance, is uh let's start from irradiance irradiance in the energy which it's the incoming energy to the surface to the sensor etc the radiance in the air is the energy which go out okay exiting from a surface or surface it's denoted by l like this okay <clears throat> in a minute you will see what's the difference in in mathematical terms okay but just just to have the flavor so what is radiant flux? Okay, radiant flux is energy per unit time. It's measured in watts, but received by the sensor. Okay, so I have a lot of light coming here to the sensor, and I would like to know <clears throat> the energy per unit time. Okay, this this is the time energy. Time, sorry, time density of the energy. It measured. It is measured in watts. Okay, denoted by phi. This is the radiant flux, okay? <clears throat> what is irradiance? Now I'm interested not just in the time density, but in the area density. So irradiance is the area density of the radiant flux, which means that given the sensor with area A, we consider the average flux over the entire sensor of the area, which is phi, what we had before, the radiant flux, this is the radiant flux divided by the area A, okay? And this is measured, okay, in watts per square meter, okay? So what is irradiance? Irradiance, look at, at the space, look at the surface, and measure the uh, a, a radiant flux per area, okay? Measure the uh, uh, energy per unit time per area, okay? Therefore, it's watts per meter square, okay, like, like what uh, is written here, this is the irradiance, which is denoted by E. Um, now, I would like to answer the question that I raised before. Uh, why, we, we already know what is radiant energy, which follows the surface, why some parts are lighter, why some parts are darker. Anybody has an idea? 
Okay, I'll try to answer. So there is an, an issue which is called the, the Lambert's law. Maybe you're familiar with it. And I'll try to, uh, to explain uh, um, what does it mean. So consider uh, a, a flux field which incident on the surface area with area A, like this. Okay. So uh, we denoted the radiant flux energy per time we denoted by phi and the area we denoted by A. The ratio between them is going to be the E radians, which is the energy per time per area. Okay. Or we can say that phi is E times A. Okay. Now I'm going to tilt uh, um, uh, the surface in, in the angle of theta. But I'm staying with the same flux phi, didn't change it. Now it's going to be uh, 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 to incident on the, on the area A prime. Okay. However, now uh, what is going to happen? It's going to happen that the same energy is spread on a larger area. Therefore, if I'm going, I want to measure the, uh, uh, the E radians at the, at the surface, okay, which is the following, I have the same flux phi divided by A prime, because this is the area A prime, and therefore the E radians is going to be phi cosinus theta divided by the A, because A, A prime is A, sorry, A prime is A divided by cosinus theta, okay? So I'm going to have that when uh, uh, the flux hit a surface, the irradiance is going to be proportional to the cosine of the angle between the light direction and the surface normal. So if the surface is like this, I'm going to have phi divided by A. If the surface is tilted by cosine, cosine theta, I'm going to be phi cosine theta divided by A. And this is the reason the, to what you had you have understand before that some uh, uh, parts here are darker since the normal of the surface here uh, toward the light is with cosine theta smaller than the normal which uh, 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 in here okay say for example that the lights come from the upper part okay so this is the situation that you have to take into account the Lambert law and to understand why the irradiance is uh, uh, reduced due to uh, the, the irradiance that it's falling on the surface is reduced by this factor, okay? So uh, what kind of uh, lights do we have? Uh, just I'm scanning a few of them. So we have something for, for example, like the sun, which it's infinitely uh, far. And uh, therefore, all the direction are identical, coming from the same direction, we denote it by L, the same direction, and hit the surface, okay? This is, ca this is called directional lighting. <coughs> uh, isotropic point source is a, a point source, is a light source that uh, spread directly the same energy to all direction. This is, for example, you can take, for example, uh, uh, a table lamp, okay, for example. There are some kind of other light sources when, uh, uh, when you have spotlight, like the name spotlight, and you have a cone, and you highlight a, a, the object with the cone, not full angle, just a, a, with small cone angle. This is called spotlight source. And when you think about the fluorescent uh, that uh, comes from the upper part of the room, you can think about area light source, like this. This is kind of light that we can uh, think of, and there are others. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. Um, okay, so, so far we spoke about how we measure the energy per time per unit area. However, it turns out that we need also to measure the energy per direction. In order to measure the energy per, we, we would like to uh, divide the space not only by areas, but also by direction. In order to, lead, to do this, we'd like to understand what is a solid angle, okay? So let's start from something which you're all familiar with it. Um, actually, what is the angle theta? Angle theta is 
uh, when I have a, a circle, is the ratio between the arc length, L, and the radius R. So in a circle, we have in the total two pi radians. Same thing happens with the sphere. Here, it's not an arc length, but it's an area, okay, on the sphere. This is an area on the sphere. And the uh, a, a solid angle that determined by the area by, by this area on the sphere is actually the area A divided by the radius squared. Okay? And this will give us the solid, ang solid angle. So since the sphere has a, an area of 2 pi, sorry, 4 pi r squared, then we have uh, in total on the sphere. 4 pi steradians. Before we had radians, and now we have 4 pi steradians. Is this clear? Or are familiar with this? Yes, it's clear. It's clear. Okay. Okay. Um, I hope I. Okay, I'm okay with the recording. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. So just to illustrate, I have some object, far object, I have a point, I have a surface, and I'm uh, sending rays to this object, and the object, the projectile of the object on the sphere is this piece, and let's say that the uh, uh, radius is one, therefore the angle, the, the solid angle is going to be the area of this piece, okay? This is the solid angle, subtended by the object which is far away from the point here, okay? Why is this important? Because since irradiance was measured uh, per unit area, the radiance actually is the solid angle density of the irradiance. What do I mean by that? I have a point P and I have a direction W. And actually, what is radiance? Radius is the energy, a long array, defined by the origin point P and the direction W. And therefore, actually, what is radiance? It's the energy per unit time, per unit area, per unit solid angle. OK? And therefore, it's watts per meter square per steradians. This is the solid angle, OK? It is very important to understand the difference between the irradiance and radiance because <clears throat> eventually we are very interested in directions. We measure, we measure the energy over directions, okay? But I'll give some examples. I hope everything is going to be clear. Any question? Okay. So let's try to understand this. A surface like this experiences radiance LP W, this is P, this is the direction W, coming from, in solid, in, coming from solid angle DW, like this, gets the following irradiance. What I mean by that? What happens on the surface? Okay, this is from certain direction. So what happens on the surface? I'm going to get on the surface the radiance, the energy LPW, and I have to take into account the theta between w and the normal to the surface and i reduce according to it the energy i multiply by cosine theta and i take it into account also the solid angle dw so if i have some era some radians coming from some direction in order to understand what falls on the surface i have to do this calculation okay is this clear When you say what falls on the surface, you actually mean uh, what was originally originally on the surface that uh, was radiated on. on what is on radiated the onto the surface? Yeah. Yeah. So the surface is radiating. Yeah, not the surface. What falls on the surface? What comes to the surface? So I have something which comes from this direction. Oh, okay. Because the arrow is uh, flipped. It seems like there is it's flipped. So, uh, okay, okay. It's not flipped. It's it's the, the way the, that you are. 
this comes from some direction and fall onto the surface, okay? And you, so later on, you will see that you have, you will under, on, in order to understand what totally ha falls onto, onto the surface, you have to take into account all the directions, okay? But if you want to understand what comes from a certain direction, you have to take the radians and you have to take into account of the Lambert's law and the solid angle. And in a minute, you will see that the units are okay because the radius is going to be uh, watts per meter square and everything is going to be okay. It's, it's exactly what uh, this we discussed before. <clears throat> so, okay, um, and what is it? The, the solid angle here is the angle of our surface with respect to the origin of the light? It's with respect to what you see here, okay? How it falls on the sphere which I don't, I, I didn't uh, draw it the sphere, it's respect to what you see here. You see this tilted there? Yeah, okay. Okay, but good question, very good question. Yes, this is very confusing. This is a good question. So, radiance is a fundamental quantity that we would like to measure because it says what light we have in the environment. If you heard the word the light field, this is exactly the light field. <clears throat> it's associated with, with ray, it's constant along the ray. And actually, what is rendering is all about computing gradients. And in the, pin, in, in the pinhole camera, when we look what happens in each pixel, we would like to measure the radians, okay? Or to, re, to imitate the radians, okay? So just uh, following your, your, the question, the two questions that were before, so if I want to collect the irradiance from the environment, I would like to take into account the radiance that coming from all directions. I denote it but L, I, P. P, this is a point which here. And <clears throat> W then goes for all direction on the hemisphere, okay? Each direction on the hemisphere, I call it W, and the integration is DW over all the hemisphere, okay? Denoted by the H2. And I multiply it by cosinus theta. Of course, theta depends on W. Okay, it's not written here, but theta depends on W. So if I want to know the uh, total flux per unit area on the surface up due to incoming light from all direction, I have to do this integral on the hemisphere to take into account the radiance from all direction, to take into account, account the Lambert law, and to take into account the integration on the entire hemisphere. Okay. Okay. Let's move on. So this is just an illustration when you sit here and you look at the sky and you want to understand how much uh, uh, energy you get. This is exactly what we had before. We have the radiance, we have the, the Lambert laws, the cosine between the normal and the, the direction. And that's what we see. Okay. Okay. We move on to uh, the part of materials. Uh, uh, let's try to uh, illustrate what happens there. So, it, it, when light hits a surface, the way it's reflected, scattered on the surface, de depend on the surface material properties. For example, if I hit a wall with light, uh, the light will be spread to its direction in, in, in the same way. But if I had uh, uh, a mirror with the light, uh, then just some certain direction will get uh, the light back. The, the light will bounce in just particular direction. Okay, this is the idea of materials. All the idea of materials is encoded by some uh, function which is called by directional reflect reflectance distribution function, or in short, BRDF. And the BRDF answers the following question: Given incoming direction W i how much light gets scattered in any given outgoing direction, WO, WR, never mind, okay, WO, okay? <clears throat> so the BRDF, what it tells us, how bright a surface appears when viewed from one direction while light falls from, an from another one, okay? How, uh, I'm, my, my, I'm looking for a certain direction, it depends on the direction, and I have light from the other direction, how it looks like. The BRDF take into account the direct light. What do I mean by that? 
it takes into account on, only the light that comes from the light sources to the surface. In a few slides, you will understand that you are going to deal also with the global light. Just, just to, uh, to mention it now, uh, this is called the direct light. I'm looking at, on the light source and I'm, under, I'm trying to understand how the BRDA facts, okay? So this is the, uh, uh, the mathematical way. And in a minute, you will see some uh, very nice example. I hope it's going to be clear. So this is the hemisphere, okay? And I have some radiance, incident radiance. I, mean, I denoted it by Ly, okay? Coming from this direction. This is direction omega i. We know that the incident irradiance that comes to the surface is Li times cosine, cosine theta i times d omega i. We already know, we discussed it. And we would like to answer the following question for a certain direction, which I call r, okay? I want to know the reflected radiance, the energy in this direction, certain direction, which I call r, okay? So this is exactly what the BRDF is going to tell me. The BRDF measure the ratio between the reflected energy in direction R, or we call it R, divided by the incident energy that came from this direction. This is LR times EI. And it depends on the point on, on the two directions. It's, it's, a, a, it's a function of the position, the incoming direction and the reflected direction, okay? It can change from point to a different direction, okay? And this ratio is called the BRDF. And you can understand later on if you want, but BRDF, the units of the BRDF I one, are one over the steradians, okay? What, what we, the solid angle that we described before. Let's see some example that will be, will be more clear. So if I have a perfect mirror and I'm lighting, the light comes from here, I'll see, I'll see the light only from this direction. The other direction will not gain any light, okay? If I have a wall or ground or anything like this, if I have light which comes from here, all direction will get the same energy. It doesn't matter from which direction you are going to take the image, and it doesn't matter which is the viewpoint. Here it matters, the viewpoints. There are also something which is called glossy speculi, like, like plastics, that you get some, the light comes from here, and you get some uh, direction uh, on the other side that will be reflected from the surface to, the, to this side. There is also, which is something called retroreflective, which in Hebrew it's, uh, I think, uh, uh, that of bicycle, for example, or of car, for example, that you have the lights come from here and then bounce back in the same direction, okay? So the BRDF take into account all this combination of directions and let us know what fraction of uh, radiance that fall on the surface, irradiance that follows the surface is coming out in the reflected direction, okay? Is this clear? Okay, yes. good. So this is example of perfect uh, uh, specular uh, uh, reflection. Okay, you ha have the light here, and this is just a perfect mirror, and it's exactly in the same angle, comes back, and not in any other place. Okay. This is all. This all images here are rendering of a. a, 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 a uh, materials uh, of teapot, okay, this is uh, the uh, diffuse, what we call the diffuse VRDF, uh, which in every direction, direction is the same energy. This is plastic, what we call glossy. This is semi-glossy. This is mirror. Okay. Um, now I'm going to uh, uh, recap everything in, in equation. It is called the reflection equation that take into account a, a bunch of multiple light sources, not just one, uh, and say what is the reflected light uh, that we are going to get. So let, let's try to understand, understand the illustration. 
this is the surface, this is X or P, what we denoted before, this is the normal to the surface, this is the uh, uh, incoming, the energy is coming from here, and from here, I call it WI or omega I, and this is the reflected direction, this is the I, this is the viewer, okay? Call it omega R, okay? So I'd like to understand what I'm going to see from here if I'm collecting all energy from the incoming directions. So uh, I'm going to have the following sum. Li is the incident light that come from this direction, this direction, this direction, etc., etc. Okay. And uh, we multiply it by the cosine of the incident angle, which is the norm, normal, uh, the, the inner product between the normal and the direction, uh, a certain direction. It depends on the direction. And I'm taking into account the BRDF, which depends on the point, and of course depends on the direction, the incoming direction and the reflected direction. Okay? And I sum it over all the light sources that I have, and also, I'm taking into account uh, if I have a, a, a situation when I have the reflected direction in the direction of a light source by, by itself, this is called emission, I'm taking also this into account, okay? But this is mostly zero. All this contribution is going to be reflected to the, the, to the viewer according to the material properties, the Lambert, the Lambert law, the cosine angle, the energy which, which comes in each direction. And this is the energy that is going to hit the pixel or the eye or the camera in this direction. Okay? This is the reflected light. Is this clear? Yes. Okay. So I'm now I'm replacing the, the, the summation by the integral. You know, the, the integral is of, is of the hemisphere, denoted here by omega or h2, never mind. And this is exactly the same. I'm taking into account the incident light, the BRDF, the angle, the omega i. This is the integral. Okay, this is what I'm going to see here. Okay. This is the reflection equation which take into account only the energy which comes directly from light sources. Okay, now I'm going to recap it and to move on to what it's called global illumination. So the image of three-dimensional objects depend on its shape, reflectance properties, which is the BRDF, and the distribution of the light sources. The interaction with the surface and the material properties are uh, encoded by the BRDF, by directional reflectance distribution function. And this leads to what we saw before, the reflection equation. I'm mentioning again that the reflection equation consider only local illumination, which is direct light, which is the light coming directly from the light sources to the surfaces. Okay? Okay. However, uh, we want to uh, produce photorealistic renderer and to estimate the radiance at each point in a given direction, okay? In order to do this, we would like to consider also global illumination. What do I mean by that? I mean multiple bounces. What do I mean by that? If I have a light which uh, illuminate a surface and the surface is going to, uh, the, the light is going to be scattered from this surface to, add to, the, environment, to the environment, then the surface the light from the surface is going to light another surface, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's not just the uh, light source that is going to affect the environment. It's the bounces between the surfaces that are going to affect the environment, and this is actually is called interreflections. Okay. So we have to take into account that the object. Uh, Strike other objects in the surrounding area and illuminating them. We cannot take into account only the direct light. It won't give us, as we saw in the beginning, actually, two images in the beginning, it won't give us uh, photorealistic images. Um, in addition, when light energy hits the surface, several other things can happen. 
depends on the property of the surface, like what we said before, reflection and interreflection, also refraction when the light in, uh, is uh, transmitting into a material and getting out of the material, and you mean to see a slide, and also absorption. This is an example that in addition to the reflectance or reflecting of surface, light go into the surface and uh, change its direction uh, when it enters another medium, like, like here, for example, and here, for example, and other. This actually also need to be taken into account. <clears throat> so uh, a few decades ago, uh, uh, somebody who is called, I think, name is James Kaya, um, uh, coined the, the principles of the global illumination or what we call the rendering equation. This is in contrast to what we had before. We had before the reflection equation. And he said the following uh, uh, principles. For a given indoor scene, every object in the room must contribute illumination to every other object. This is the bounces of the scatter that we, 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 we multiple bounces that we discussed before. <clears throat> Actually, according to him, there is no distinction to be made between illumination emitted from a light source and illumination reflected from a surface. And these all have to be taken into account. All this scattering has to be taken into account. Well, we have to be take into account the direct lighting and the uh, uh, scattered or interreflection lighting between the surfaces such that surface is going to illuminate, illuminate another surface, even if it is not a light source, OK? Now I'm going to explain this, uh, everything that is going to be here. Um, so we had the reflection equation. We saw it before. Uh, the, the reflection equation actually requires knowing the incoming gradients from surfaces. So what I would like to know Li, okay, Li x omega i, okay. That's th that's what we need to know in order to understand what is the reflected light in a certain direction. But in order to determine this, actually, uh, as we just discussed before, we would like to understand uh, what is the reflected radiance from the other surfaces. Okay, this is exactly what discussed before. So actually, we have to compute another reflection equation, another integral in order to answer this question. OK? So let's try to understand what do I mean by, by, by uh, this uh, uh, recursive uh, relation. So actually, um, I would like to understand, uh, sorry, what is the um, uh, reflection in this direction in order to do this? I would like to understand what is uh, the incoming energy, for example, in this direction, but not just from light, but from other surface that are, is in the environment. So I would like to know what is the reflected light in the uh, opposite direction that come from another surface denoted by X tilde, okay? And actually, I don't know it. Because in order to know it, I need to solve the reflection equation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, I have unknown on the left hand side and unknown on the right hand side, and each unknown here is actually is uh, uh, actually another reflection equa equation by itself. It means that this is actually a recursive calculation that I need to do in order to understand what is going to be in this uh, direction. OK, is, it, is this clear? Yes. OK. Yes, but in complex uh, scenarios, this uh, becomes uh, computationally very extensive. Exactly. I'm going to, this, to, to speak about it. Great, great. So the rendering equation is a recursive equation. And, and you can see it from here. This, this, this is just an illustration. This is the eye. This is the camera. I would like to understand in this direction what happens. So I have to take into account all these directions. But each such direction have to take into account all this direction. It's, it becomes exponential, like you said in a minute before. So <coughs> of course, it's not realistic. 
So what, what people do, okay? So you understand that the analytic solution, it's very hard. And also it's very challenging to apply directly the recursive ray tracing. It can become an exponential uh, computation. Uh, but still we want to get uh, some photorealistic uh, imaging. We would like to know whether we have shadow here, like this. We would like to know to take into account the light source. We would like to know whether we see what we see from these view rays. Okay. So here comes the idea of, of Monte Carlo rendering, uh, which gives some heuristic, I'm not sure if to say you give some a way to sample uh, the environment and to give some flavor of a uh, photorealistic images without exhaustive recursive ray tracing. Just want to mention that ray tracing here is very crucial in a sense that the uh, uh, if I want to use rasterization, it's instead of standing ray from the camera, I'm even not sure exactly which ray I, I need to evaluate. In the ray tracing, although it's expensive, it becomes uh, very evident and clear. Okay, so let, let's try to understand just um, very briefly what is Monte Carlo rendering. Uh, but before this, I would like to show you what happens if you take into account the direct illumination and also the reflection and transparency uh, properties of the of the of the environment. It look not not bad, but if you look. Here, of course, you see something which is more realistic when the global illumination is taken into account and there is ray tracing, there is recursive ray tracing or Monte Carlo, which I'm going to describe in a minute. It's very important to take it into account. Okay, so I'm going to uh, speak about the ray tracer and the Monte Carlo. Uh, so we would like to generate a photorealistic image. We would like to combine color material the geometry, ray tracing, and rendering quotient, all of this in the Monte Carlo ray tracing algorithm. Um, <clears throat> and the idea is going to be the following. Everybody knows how to estimate an integral. We have an integral. Uh, we want to estimate the integral. We sample points. And if we sample uniformly, we get actually the average okay, of, the, of, the, of the points, like, like this, if we want to estimate between 0 and 1. I'm taking the average of the of the point which I sample, and I get the the uniform. Uh, I get uh, the uh, numerical uh, integration uh, method for uh, for the integral. Actually, Monte Carlo method randomly choose samples, and instead of a, a, a going recursively on 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 each uh, set possible set of of rays, it take path. Uh, uh, and for each path, it take it into account. I'm going to describe exactly what I mean by that. So we'd like to solve the rendering equation. Like here, we have light, and we have some specular surface. Uh, so the light comes from here, and also the light comes from here. And this is the eye, and this is the pixel, and this is the diffuse surface. And all of this we want to take into account. And I would like to integrate the radius for, for each pixel by sample, sampling path randomly. Um, uh, I would like maybe to go to this slide, sorry for that. Okay, so I'm starting with some, the, the, the direction which I'm interested in, and I'm not sampling everything on the way. I'm then randomly generate another direction, and then randomly generate another direction, and another direction, till I reach the light source, and uh, this is called a path, and this path is going to be taken into account in the integration, and then I'm, I'm taking another path, for example, another path start, starting from it, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and this is going to uh, construct my numerical integration. Uh, I'm taking into account uh, the direct illumination and the indirect illumination, but very important is that the sampling is going to be uh, wise. What do I mean by wise? It, it's called important sampling. For example, if I have a mirror, okay, like this, I, I know according to the BRDF that the reflectance is in a certain direction, okay, like this. So I don't want to take path 
that will take into account something if the light comes from here something which will go here okay so this is called imported sampling uh, and that's what the monte carlo do sampling is according to distribution of the brdf and the light sources this saves time and do it uh, 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 more realistic uh, not just to shoot ray without any uh, uh, wise uh, sampling and just to make things more realistic the, the, the number of samplings of the passes is very important. For example, here <clears throat> we have an image that produced by one sample per pixel, and then the number of sample was doubled, like two, four, etc., 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 until we reach here. And you see how much the number of samples is very important in order to get something which is not noisy and photorealistic. Um, <clears throat> Just a minute. This is another example. Here, for example, we take into account all, all just the direct illumination without taking into account the bounces of the surfaces. Okay, just direct. Now I'm taking into account also one bounce from the surface into the global illumination. So the the situation is more uh, lighty, is more uh, clear. And I'm moving on with two bounces and four bounces. It's look better and better, like what you, what you see here. Um, you maybe see that there are some artifacts here, it's maybe due to not enough sampling. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what to say about it. <clears throat> can, you go, can, you, can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah. Can you go back to the previous slide? <clears throat> the one with the balls, with the ball. This one? Uh, one back. This one. Uh, is it like in this? No, the one after. This one? No, the one after. This one? No, the one with the red ball. This is the red ball, no? Or just this, Okay. Yeah, maybe there was I understand that what I see is not immediately what you see. Sorry for that. Okay, sorry. Uh, may, like it sounds very computationally expensive to add more samples. So maybe it can be like it can be uh, also achieved by using, uh, for example, the one, the fourth uh, one in the top right, and then use some denoising uh, techniques. Uh, I see. Um... Or interpolation. Okay. Yeah, Inter actually, interpolation is more used in the rasterization process. Mm, also here it used, but the, the idea is to, uh, uh, to I, I'll, I'll try to say something. I'm not sure, maybe it's a good idea. I didn't think about it. Maybe it's a good idea. But the idea is that any path of ray meet other kind of situation. So it just, it, it's not a noise in terms of, you know, Gaussian noise. It's noise in terms that I didn't see the whole situation yet. So if you uh, emit enough number of rays, then the idea is that you hit one surface and then another surface and then another surface and it will hit another path, you will meet something else in the environment. So maybe it's a good idea, I'm not sure, but I will still think that it's not just a matter of the noise, it also, you see, it's also a matter of the shadow, how it's look like but, but if you assume continuity so you can't like approximate it i i'm not sure about the, about the uh, maybe if you in 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 some uh, uh a, i don't know uh, to, to say wise way or or, or a partition way take into account the sample in one in an image in another image okay that's for example, what I see here, for example, which uh, disturbs me, look at the shadow here and the shadow at the bottom, you know? So I'm not sure that naive denoising will give you exactly what we have seen here, okay? So if I'll take this and I'm averaging with it this way by denoising, I, I'm not sure, but I think it's a good direction to think about it. It's, it's, I didn't think about it. Good, good idea to think about it. Yeah, I have a question also. Uh, in case of uh, Monte Carlo, you said we choose a path, right? Mm -hmm. 
so it means that I have uh, to know all the paths that exist. Or I do it uh, like uh, go uh, choose one path. No, the... it's, it's everything is randomly. You you just should shoot for a direction in a random way according actually not exactly according to the distribution of the brdf and the light sources so you know the situation you know the environment and you tune your your randomness due to the situation so for example for example let, let me let me let me have you an example maybe for example here okay i have a ray that i shoot from the camera through this pixel now I would like to understand whether it's a shadow or not a shadow. What do I do? I take another ray, okay? This is the path that we just uh, discussed, and shoot it to the light source. If this ray on the way meets an object, I know that this point is going to be in a shadow, okay? So it's... Okay. it's but again you uh, but i could say okay i have another array that goes to another direction not in not to the light source sure 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 that, that's it but if if you want to know the, the actually you 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 send a couple of rays okay you can send the shadow ray you can send refraction ray you can send many rays and or in order to understand what is the situation exactly right Um, another question, if I have a light source that is infinitely far away, like the sun, do I need the rays to go exactly in that direction? Wouldn't they all miss it if it's a single point? You know, the sun uh, is considered directional lighting. Uh, okay, but, but maybe I'll, 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 I'll make some disclaimer. Uh, the, the, the idea is that the, the rendering, the situation of the rendering is mostly in indoor scenes. Okay, so I have some light sources which are, you know, uh, in the indoor, in the in the indoor scene and not outside scene. So you take into account the, the direction of the of the sun if needed. But as you see, also the the, the rendering equation is mostly uh, dedicated for the indoor scenes, less for the outdoor scenes. Okay. Can you explain again also for Monte Carlo what happened if I see an reflection of object inside the mirror let's say i'm not sure if i know how to under, to uh to exactly to it should be taken into account i'm not sure exactly how uh, this is a very advanced uh, procedure in the rendering to take into account the reflection and the and the and, and the uh, uh the mirroring mirroring it's okay but to take into account transparent uh, material i mean that the light comes inside and go out etc i'm not sure exactly how it is done it is done, but no, I'm not sure how exactly. Also, when we do a rendering, we need to know all these parameters for each pixel, uh, because let's say we have objects that have several uh, materials inside it. No, so you need to do. Uh, you need to, to. You need to store all the information that you want to render. Somehow, I'm not sure exactly how you store it very efficiently, but you need it. Yeah. Otherwise. You won't get what you want. Yeah. OK, let's just recap. <clears throat> so we discussed computer graphics, and in particular, we discussed uh, rendering techniques, ray tracing, rasterization. We discussed geometry representation, including implicit and explicit uh, representation. And uh, we understand that uh, it can be useful to use by setting coordinate. Uh, we discussed radiometry, uh, radiometry uh, about the energy of radius and irradiance. And all, all, also we discussed the BRDF, which uh, reflects the uh, local illumination models that constitutes a reflection equation. And uh, uh, <clears throat> then we discussed the global model, which constitutes the rendering equation. We understand that it's very challenging to solve directly the rendering equation, and there are simplification by Monte Carlo sampling and also some other methods, for example, which are called the, uh, uh, never mind, well, let's speak about it next time. And uh, I, I hope that having this in mind, 
you understand why it's so important to uh, use also uh, deep learning techniques that somehow uh, can accelerate, illustrate, uh, helps us to solve this uh, challenging uh, rendering equation. And this is what we are going to see in the next lecture.